Welcome to another Zoom call. A number of questions came in. Make sure you chat in your questions. And when we get through these, then we'll get to the chat questions. Always remember to go to your member site to look for any updates that might be um, any changes that we made. Um, remember that you can call and make an appointment with me. If you do so, um, we call that an educational coaching call to keep us safe from the predators of the medical association. And we ask that you just complete that coaching call request form um, right there. It's on the home page of the member site. Um, so we can get ahead and see what things you want to discuss. Uh, don't forget that you have access to all our courses and um, our blog posts. Let's jump to the question. Dr. Cutters, you wanted to know my vitamin D level, and it was 79.6. I currently am taking three 80K of ale, so the 80K of it comes 80K of ale has 5,000 IUs of vitamin D. Vitamin D is measured in international units. Um, so 15,000 IUs, and remember, the vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So, you know, if you're not dealing with low vitamin D levels, you don't necessarily even need to take vitamin D on a daily basis. It will store in your body. Um, so what are the proper levels of vitamin D? Well, depending on what lab runs your tests, uh, because different labs have the right to say what is a normal range or not. Um, uh, so most labs will say 30 to 80 is a normal range of vitamin D, 30 to 80 deciliters per milliliter. And it's, uh, but you know, as I've written in my book, and, and we've talked about this before, I really want my patients to have a vitamin D level of 50 to 150. So if you're over, if you're at like one, if you were, if you said your vitamin D level was 179, then I would say, okay, drop down to one a day or take, you know, one every other day. Is that too high? Is there a danger of getting too high of vitamin D? Well, anything is, you could be able to balance, right? Um, but even somebody who has, you know, vitamin D at 179, I still don't think that's really too high. I still, I don't think you necessarily don't need to be taking as much vitamin D exogenously if you're, if you're at 179. But if you're at 79, I'd keep taking three. If it takes three uh, 80K uh, complete, which is 15,000 IUs a day to get you at seven, to get you at 79, um, then you really need to be taking three. Um, you know, is somebody else had a, last week had a vitamin D of 45 or something like that. Is that too low? Well, no, technically that's totally within range, except if you're trying to, you know, stimulate an immune response and vitamin D can, the beauty of vitamin D is it's immune modulating um, and it'll kill protect you from an autoimmune response and it'll help your body fire a response against a cancer or a pathogen. So the higher, higher is better for sure. So if I was at, if I tested my vitamin D and I was 40, I would start taking ADK um, or a vitamin D up 10 to 15,000 IU so that I'd get it rechecked again. You really want it above 50. That's the goal. I've been drinking five pounds of juiced carrots per day. So five pounds of carrots juiced per day for two months now since the diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. A uh, sort of natural chemotherapy. Do you agree? Um, so yes, juicing carrots, is that a natural chemotherapy? Well, juicing carrots can be a good source of nutrition. Is that a natural chemotherapy? No, I wouldn't agree with that. It's a good source of good solid nutrition, which is beneficial for your immune system. 
The negative thing about juicing carrots is that it does have a lot of glucose in it and it can raise your glucose levels. So if your cancer is really driven through glycolysis, then it can be a wrong thing to do. But if juicing carrots over the course of the last two months and your cancer hasn't grown, um, then I wouldn't be so concerned about that. Um, Juicy carrots also has, uh, juicing anything also has some negative things that they that the juicy pro juicing people don't talk about, is that that's all raw. Well, they talk about that as positive because since it's all raw nutrition and it has all the enzymes in it, you haven't cooked it and ruined it and destroyed all the nutrition in it. Um, but I just I just don't buy that. So if you if you're juicing, you're basically pre-digesting things. So you're breaking things down to, you know, you know, very small size, not molecular size, but very small size. So it's easier for you to digest. So you're pre-digesting it, but you still have to absorb those things. That means you still need enzymes secreted by your pancreas in enough of a hefty dose in order for you to be able to break it down to molecular size for you to absorb that. And as we age, we end up with less of those. Even if you're taking oral enzymes, you're taking an exogenous enzyme capsule, um, you can still have some issues with digesting raw food. So people go on a raw food diet thinking that that's the best because they listen to Chris, Chris Wark or something like that. And they're over 30 years old and they're taking, they're juicing, you know, 10 glasses of juice a day. And they're getting gut, gut issues and things like that because they're not really absorbing very well. And so even if it's better nutrition because you're juicing, if you're not absorbing it, you're, you're just depositing it into the toilet. So it's going through this tube called your intestinal tract and it's going right into the toilet. You're not getting the nutrition out of it that you really should. Matter of fact, there's a diet called the GAPS diet. So when people are really ill, um, especially when they have bad gut issues from food sensitivities and all sorts of things like that, which can end up leading to cancer, which can people maybe listening to this fit into that category, the GAPS diet, you're not taking anything raw. You're basically making soup out of everything. So you're making a soup out of your, your vegetables. You're cooking it all day long and you're, it's, it's pre-digesting in itself and the, the juicing crowd would go, oh, you're killing the enzymes. Enzymes aren't destroyed by that. You're still going to get the benefit out of the nutrients. And you're breaking down the nutrients into a particle size that is pre-digested, just like juicing. And it's going to be a lot easier on your body and on your gut to be able to absorb those things. You're not throwing away all the vitamins in the carrots because you're drinking the soup. You're eating the broth too. So... Um, I don't fall into the category that juicing is the right thing to do for everyone. Now, understand if your if your um, cancer isn't fed mainly off of glycolysis, and you're able to tolerate juice, and you like the taste of it, and you're absorbing a lot of it, and it's doing well for you. I'm not against it, but I'm not a person that thinks that you should be going on a raw food diet in order to heal your cancer. I think any of those diets like that can be wrong for a lot of people. Also, I just received my genetic report and there is a beta carotene gene, the BCMO gene this person is talking about. The BCMO gene is a gene that those genes, what they do is help make an enzyme to break down vitamin A. And when a person has a lot of BCMO gene defects, they don't break down vitamin A and don't utilize the vitamin A. So they actually need to take, it may be a good thing to take more vitamin A. So if you're juicing carrots, you're getting beta carotene from the carrots. So um, that is the right thing to do. So, you know, for just based upon that gene, eating more carrots um, would be the right thing to do. So if for, for that, gene defect, supporting it with increasing your vitamin A through food, aka carrots, is the right thing to do. The cancer continues to grow on my one remaining kidney. I would like to discuss taking ivermectin and the clinic's ability to provide me with it. 
So ivermectin, again, we've spoken about this a lot in the last year, is a highly overlooked and underutilized and underspoken about uh, off use of an off-label, an off-label use of a drug. So ivermectin is a drug that's an anti-parasitic drug that um, has been shown, and there are some studies, you can Google them, uh, there are some studies that show that ivermectin can kill cancer. Um, so I'm all for taking ivermectin. There really isn't any downsides. There's really not really any, you know, it's, it's one of those drugs that have been used for decades and decades with very, very little um, side effects. So um, as far as the clinic's ability to provide you with that, we have no ability to provide you with that because um, the only over-the-counter ivermectin is the is for horses. Um, and you could buy that at, at farm and fleet store or fleet farm store um, and take that based upon your weight, but that has to be done by you and I can't oversee that. So if you want to get the human prescribed ivermectin, you'll have to go to a prescribing doctor to be able to get that. The tumor board met last week and suggested doing three rounds for nine weeks of chemotherapy to debulk the neck tumors before doing radiation in the fall. She's suggesting these three medications, these three um, um, chemotherapy drugs. She said it will be harsh, especially the 5-FU, because that's a combination one, and will cause mouth sores along with other terrible side effects. Well, at least they're being honest with you. Or you could use the, these three, still using the 5-FU, or you could use these three. Um, we didn't discuss these, so I don't know about the side effects. Do you know, do you have any thoughts about these? Um, we've had patients that have used all sorts of different combination chemotherapies um, and understand you know, th there's, I cannot tell people legally or, or even morally and ethically that chemotherapy is not the right thing to do because we've had people literally, I think, save their life take, doing some chemotherapy. So, um, and, and the other thing is even if we had 10 people that did this combination for whatever type of cancer, your, even if it was the exact same type of cancer that you have, it, it's still not going to be telling how you're going to respond the, the positives or negative response that any single person will have to that same combination of drugs just because your body reacts so differently than everything else. I would say this, and I've said this you know, dozens of times in the past, if you're going to choose to do chemotherapy, you've got to have a positive outlook on it can't be all down in the dumps. You can't be all sad about it because you want to go, okay, I'm choosing to do this. If God is leading me to do this, I am going to, you know, believe in my heart that God's going to use this to kill the cancer and knock this down. If you go into any type of protocol thinking, oh, I, just, I feel like I'm losing and I feel like I'm, you know, um, doing something I don't want to do and and you go and you agree to do it because you feel like it's your only option. I, I just don't think you're going to have as good of results. I think there's a lot of evidence that support that comment that I just made. And I just don't think that's the right way to do it. I mean, if you really, really honestly feel so negatively, and I'm not talking about the person who wrote this, I'm just talking to in general, anybody, if anybody feels so negatively about chemotherapy, then don't do it until you feel like you have permission to do it. Um, have a good attitude about anything that you choose to do. Know that God is going to protect you in all those things that he's going to have his hand on you. And yeah, you're going to do some things like we talked about last week about fasting for 24 hours before the IV and then going off your, your um, antioxidants for 48 hours post chemo and then going and hitting it hard with antioxidants and doing foot baths on a daily basis to pull that stuff out of your body um, and trust that God's going to protect you through this and he's going to use this. Um, side note, people have asked me um, personally how Anne's son, AJ, who had 
uh, uh, leukemia, how he's doing it. Just spoke with her, text back and forth uh, yesterday and the day before. Again, just to recheck with her again. He's doing fantastic. He did do the chemo. And I am convinced if he wouldn't have done the chemo, he would have passed away. He his cancer was just just went bonkers, rampant, and he was on death's door um, before it was all figured out. So if just you know, God can use anything. He can use chemo to heal you. Um, so you know, just have that attitude that if God is leading you towards doing chemo or radiation or surgery or whatever it is, um, you know, just you know doesn't mean you go in there blindly and you're going to do it because you're you're you know you're making a foolish decision but be praying about it and trusting that his head is going to be in it and you're going to be protected through it so other part of this question i can't tell you which combination is better i i, I can't tell you even if i do that answer nobody knows that answer matter of fact your oncologist is saying they don't know that answer this is just their protocols that they followed and the only reason why they have this protocol versus putting everybody on this is because some people will start on their primary protocol and they'll get sick and they'll think that, you know, they reacted negatively towards something and it was, they'll switch out of one of the products. So uh, that is just good practice of medicine. So um, that's why they have, you know, different protocols because some people have allergies towards different drugs too. I lost 20 pounds this winter from going vegan, but can't put weight back on. I feel like my metabolism is on hyperdrive and I have cachexia. I think I answered this question last week, but uh, is there a way to reverse this and gain the weight and muscle? I'm sticking to the diet you gave me and eating as much as possible. Yeah, go back to the blog, search that word cachexia. And I think I have a video and a bunch of different things to do. Um, if you truly do have cachexia, even if you have, so even if you're, I mean, cachexia is defined that you're losing two to five pounds a week, no matter what you're doing, you can't, you're in this plummet of weight loss. Um, but it doesn't sound like that's what it is. Maybe you lost the 20 pounds, you feel like you're underweight, you're stable now, but you want to gain weight back. You can still um, go to the blog and search cachexia because there's things that you can do and follow in there that can help you gain, put some weight back on. About a year ago, I did the saliva test, the cheek swab test through the clinic. The results indicated that the drivers of my cancer are histamine, dairy, and toxins. Um, will I need to eat low histamine and avoid dairy the rest of my life? Well, I don't remember what your histamine genes are, um, but if you don't have a lot of defects in your histamine genes, and we didn't point that out in your genetic testing, then the answer to that is no, you will not have to eat low histamine, you know, a low histamine diet the rest of your life um, if you're in a full remission. So if a person's in full remission of their cancer and dairy and histamine were drivers of their cancer, so let's say you have no genetic issues with histamine, um, then I'd say going back on some histamine food slowly uh, and carefully would be fine. Going back and eating some good organic dairy, um, especially butter, would be just fine. If you have a lot of genetic issues with histamine, that's going to be just an issue forever. Those genetic issues are never going to go away. Um, nobody should be eating a lot of dairy, period. Nobody, if you can't have cancer or not. Uh, personally, I don't drink any milk. I eat butter, um, and I do eat some cheese. But, um, uh, well, okay. Is there another test to determine which toxins are driving the cancer? Well, if your cancer is in remission, um, it may not, nothing may show um, with the cheek swab test. Is there other tests to determine what toxins you have that could be an issue of your cancer? Um, yes, there's lots of other tests. So uh, if you, um, went to the lab store uh, and you, uh, so so there's some good tests that I would say would be beneficial 
to look at if you're looking at specific toxins uh, and um, uh, here's two of them. So the GPL tox test looks for glyphosates. The mycotox test looks for mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are from mold. Those are two things that you could look at. This GPL text test is um, uh, underutilized for sure. So glyphosates are a huge issue and a huge problem in our environment. So th there's lots of different ways that you can measure these things by running these different tests. Uh, there is a, so I'm just looking real quest, quick through the toxic tests that you could run. There is a metals hair test that you could do, that you could do, that gives you a picture of uh, toxic metals in, uh, uh, by doing a hair analysis test. Um, but it's, so as far as toxins go, then there are some uh, Cyrex panels. I think it's the Array 12. Um, uh, no, not the Array 12. That will measure if you have antibodies to toxins. So that's a whole other picture. So, you know, if I have toxins in my body, uh, it's the Array 11. So the Cyrex Array 11 measures antibodies to different toxins and biomarkers, which is a whole other ball of wax. If people have serious illness that they, you know, have been a lot of different places and can't get better, some of these functional medicine tests is what's measured in the array 11 can be really beneficial because you could actually end up developing antibodies to different toxins. Now you have these antibodies and every time you're exposed to these things, now you fire a reaction to those. If you also have self antibodies, meaning antibodies to self tissue, like a uh, person would in Hashimoto's, like most of you probably do um, because autoimmune disease is so rampant. And I writ wrote about in my book, you know, when it first came out in 2010, that I think cancer has an autoimmune component with every single person. So if you really want to find, dig deeper in tests, so a lot of people, you know, they come to me and they just, you know, they're, they have serious issues with cancer. And they just want to get better. And once they get into the remission, they don't want to go any farther. And then there's some people like possibly the person who asked this question, I'm actually on the wrong question here, but the person that asked this question, um, want to dig a little deeper and find out some other things that can be going on. They might be in full remission, but I want to dig deeper and and, and uh, figure out some other things. If you want to find out if you have antibodies to self-tissue, the best test, I think, is the Cyrex Array 5. So that test is um, measures self a good array of self uh, antibodies, self tissue antibodies, and um, uh, really gives you an idea if you what other things that you have going on. If you have a lot of brain fog, brain issues, I can't figure out why I can't think straight. I'm concerned about about um, Alzheimer's. Then the array fourteen and the array seven X are really good. This is the array five and all the biomarkers that it tests for. These are antibodies to all these different self tissues that are so important. And these are hidden in a lot of people. The array fourteen gives you the APO antibodies. It really looks at the brain antibodies as far as Alzheimer's disease go. So you can really measure whether I you know have to make some drastic lifestyle changes so that I you know could push. Alzheimer, Alzheimer and dementia diseases as far out into the future as possible. The Array 7 and Array 7X, 7X is a little more expanded, is antibodies to neural tissue. So different neurons, microglial cells, uh, astrocytes, and other glial cells and uh, myelin sheath cells and things like that, because that's a huge issue um, with people, especially after doing chemo. That's one of the issues that they have with quote unquote chemo brain is they actually have antibodies to neuronal tissue or they have microglial priming, which you know either one causes inflammation in the brain. 
And that's a an hour and a half lecture right there. If you want to go and look more about that, go to my the video on um, uh, um, issues that can happen with brain inflammation. I think if you go to the blog and you search brain inflammation, you can find out more information about that. Okay. So a person said to in Alyssa, this is what I ask a lot of you to do. So many times you are taking, when you guys start with me, you're taking a bunch of different supplements. So this is an example of a person that's taking a bunch of different supplements that none of this is ours, right? So, um, and when I do the testing, I may say, okay, I, I may go, okay, this is, let's let's pretend that let's let's say Essioc didn't test well at all. And I'll just say, stop. So I'll say, stop this, stop this, stop this. And all of you know what I'm talking about because I did this when I did your original testing. There's things that you're taking that I told you to stop taking. And then there's things that I said, well, you can keep taking that as long as if you want. And, and sometimes I've told you, if you can keep taking, if you run out, then let me know. And many times you many of you have let me know when you do run out of things so I can say, oh, you don't need that anymore. It was nothing wrong with you taking it. But now that you're out, don't keep taking it. I don't want you guys taking 500 different supplements. So um, so just make sure, let's say if you're, it's even better if you're like a week away, I have one week left of, let's say I didn't tell you to take the SEAC, but you felt led to take the X SEAC. Then make sure you email me. I have one week left of the SEAC and then maybe we should set up a time to talk about whether you should keep taking that or not. So, um, but because uh, when we're testing your cheek swab and you're taking all this stuff, we're testing you when you're taking that stuff. So um, I only take you off things that I think that are bad for you, that are poor, poorly chelated minerals or supplements with methyl groups uh, um you know just there's other reasons why I may take you off something enema questions for coffee enemas example the s a wilson's coffee why is it so light colored is it not roasted what are the advantages compared to starbucks dark roast um well dark roast coffee that's my favorite not starbucks but i just like dark roast the darker the roast the I, to me, it has more flavor um, because you get that roasted flavor. Um, some people like light roast. Um, honestly, I think the reason why they like light roast is because they get more of a buzz off of it. Why? Because the lighter the roast, the more caffeine in it. So the S.A. Wilson's coffee, if you cooked it up in your coffee pot and drank it, you'd probably spit it out and throw it away because it's gross. Um, it's not meant to be drink, drink. It's meant to be used in coffee out of it. It's very, very lightly roasted, if roasted at all. It's specifically for coffee enemas because it has such high caffeine in it. So if you're not going to go with the S.A. Wilson's coffee, and hey, I don't have any, I just need to do a coffee enema, get the lightest roast possible and try to get an organic one. For the coffee enema, what part of the intestine absorbs this? It's down in the rectum. If I only have 11 centimeters before the tumor, will it still absorb properly? You're not really trying to absorb this, so let me rephrase this. It's not really the absorption of it, it's a stimulation. You don't have to absorb any of it. It's the stimulation of the vagal nerve, and it's in the lower rectal area, just above the anus. So um, yeah, you still have, uh, if you only have seven, 11 centimeters before the tumor, will it still absorb properly? The answer is yes, it's not going to be absorbed properly. You're still stimulating the vagus nerve. Also, doing sodium bicarbonate enemas, the reason why this person would be good to do sodium bicarbonate enemas, so would everybody do a sodium bicarbonate? No, this person has a tumor 11 centimeters up. So that's why he's trying to get the sodium bicarbonate baking soda uh, alkalinity into the tumor uh, with frankincense and lemongrass oils. Uh, while it smells great, what are the benefits of these essential oils in the enema? These are cancer killers in themselves. That's why you would do it. Uh, I can still only get about eight ounces uh, at most of fluid in the enema. 
I guess that's okay. Yes, that is perfectly okay. That's fine. Try to hold it five minutes. Sometimes they go a, bit, a little bit longer. That's great. That's perfect. So you're doing great. Hi, Dr. Connor. Does it matter where I put the bulb under the cover? I had breast cancer. Also, I do the rife every night, but I only get to do the full time on the weekends. I normally get seven hours of my programs. That's okay. Yes, that's okay. You're getting, um, um, you know, I put the program in and, you know, I mix up the frequencies through every night. So you're not missing anything. If you were say, if you called and said, hey, I'm only, I only sleep four hours. Okay, well, that's a problem. Uh, but if you're getting seven of the eight and a half, nine hours, you're doing fine. Uh, where do you put the bulb? You uh, just as close to you as you feel comfortable. That's you just put it as close to you as you feel comfortable, even if there's clothing or something in between you. Also, I wanted to do the cataract program and I called True Rife to get a stand, but they said there was not one for the model of Rife I have. So I think they meant there's not a stand for the bulb you have. There's not a stand for the hammer bulb. There's only a stand or the QX2 or the double bubble bulb. Do you have any suggestions of where I could place the bulb so that it's one foot away from my eyes for an hour and 15 minutes? Yeah, you could just, you could put it on the back of your neck. So you doesn't have to be, you don't have to be shining at your eyes. I wouldn't recommend that. But yeah, you could put it under your neck. You could put it on the back of your neck. Um, it's going through your head. You just, you know, you don't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to put it by your feet because it's too far away from your eyes. So it, put it, you could, if you sit in a lazy boy chair or something, you could put it underneath your neck and you could lay there like that. That'd be a good thing. Or put it on top of your head if you want. I've been checking my glucose a bit after I wake up every morning. For the, for the last week, mine has been between 89 and 107. Hey, I think I spoke about this a little bit last week. Um, 89, eight, yeah, you're, that's better. 107, that's not good. So, but let's, I'll talk more about that. I notice that on days I take it at 8 a.m., it's over 100. On days I take it at 9, it's around 90. This is the total number for me over the years. But I have been eating so clean, low carb, doing intermittent fasting constantly. Could the hormone blocking medications I'm on increase my glucose and or cortisol insulin and cause these higher numbers? Possibly. There's probably not a lot of research data about that, but there anything's possible as far as using a drug. So that is possible. I haven't eliminated carbs completely, but only eat sparingly. Foods like berries, apples, and a slice of Ezekiel bread are written down by dinners, and there's no correlation. Example, the morning after I had some Culver's chocolate custard and a glass of wine as a treat, it was only 92. I've told my new oncologist's office I'm not taking another injection or pill until I get my usual full blood panels done. I will ask them if this is a side effect, but wanted to get your opinion. Well, they probably won't tell you. You're better off just um, doing a, um, <laughs> uh, an online search if that's a side effect. But I would highly doubt that that would you that you'd find that anywhere. It probably really hasn't been studied. Um, so. Back to getting your glucose levels down. This is this is going to be the most common thing when you're talking about glucose levels as, hey, my glucose is 92. No matter what I do, I can't seem to budge that. Well, I'm sorry, but this is just life. Um, your glucose levels, yes, have to do with what you eat, but it has more to do with your cells and the cell membrane's ability to um, receive that glucose and get it inside the cells. And the longer we live, the more exposed that, exposure we have to toxins that damage our cell membranes. Um, and then they're reproducing cells with damaged cell membranes, the less, um, uh, the more compromised that we have with our ability 
of our cells to receive glucose. I mean, you need glucose in a, in a daily life in order for it to break down through glycolysis for you to make ATP um, uh, and then through glycolysis to acetylcholine and A to go into the Krebs cycle for you to kick out a ton of ATP. And ATP is energy. So it's not just your muscles that need that. It's, that's how every cellular function that you have is, is reliant, is dependent upon ATP. So, um, and uh, that's where as we age, our, our pancreas isn't making insulin as well. We become more insulin resistant. Our cell membranes become insulin resistant and our cell membranes become more damaged and less healthy in a, um, the uh, glucose receiving receptors. Um, don't work as well, so it's not as easy. You know, if you if you were 23 years old and you decided to start fasting and, and cleaning up your diet, you could probably take somebody who has a average glucose of 107 and they, and get them down to to in the 80s within a week. As we age, it's just sometimes impossible. I've had people that come to me for diabetes; they don't have cancer, and their glucose is. Uh, is two, in the 200s, we put them on a super, super strict diet, almost a ketogenic diet, and it seems to do absolutely nothing for their glucose levels. Um, and the reason is, is if your glucose is at 200, then it's you have it's it's a it's diabetes, and diabetes is just a name of a disease that means that your your glucose receptors on your cell membranes have been so damaged. Now, um, you can also have Type, a person can also have type 1 diabetes is completely different. And that is an autoimmune disease of the islet cells of the pancreas where you're not able to make insulin. Um, and that's a totally different situation. Oh, to add to the glucose question, a month ago or so, I'd go to my oncologist for my injections. And before getting them, they'd take my blood around 2 p.m. My glucose would come out at about 80, two hours after eating lunch. Okay, so little... Uh, known fact is that your glucose, if you took your glucose right after you ate lunch, um, even if it wasn't a high carb lunch, your glucose will spike. That's normal. That's a postprandial glucose test. And it's normal to spike up, but then it drops down um, and then it balances out. So that's why you want to, if you're going to be taking your glucose levels to measure your glucose levels, you want to take it at a 10 or 12 hour fast on a regular basis don't do this because it'll give you a false reading of, oh, it's down to 80. That's almost in the 70s. That's really good. Yeah, because it's just dropped. It plummeted from a high after eating. And now it'll go up 80, 90, 95, and then that will be your normal. So uh, it's not a fair assessment of really where your glucose levels are on average. Okay, we got a lot of questions that came in in the chat. L-glutamine powder. Why is it not good for cancer patients? Because glutamine is a can be a direct fuel source for cancer. So not with everybody, but glutamine can be a direct fuel source of for cancer. Glutathine, glutamine, and methionine. So I write a lot about that in my book. So it's a big no-no. You're going to, you need glutamine. You need glutamine to make glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. So don't get me, don't get wrong on that. It is an essential amino acid in your body, but to take an exogenous glutamine for somebody who has a history of cancer is just downright foolishness. So you do not take glutamine. Why do you give a person, why would anybody, why would a functional doctor recommend glutamine? It's typically recommended with somebody who has gut issues and uh, if they have a damaged gut, leaky gut syndrome, uh, take L-glutamine. It's great because it'll help your cells really reproduce quickly and you can help heal your gut, you know, real nice. Well, why? Because L-glutamine is a really strong feeder, especially for epithelial cells and you'll reproduce cells quite quickly. Why would you want to do that if you had any kind of history of cancer? Very dangerous. I know functional medicine doctors that have no idea what they're doing with cancer, and they'll recommend L-glutamine for somebody because, oh, well, we got to heal the gut. Everything begins in the gut. Do you have cancer? We need to heal the gut. 
absolute idiocy on my part. So do not do that. I'm not saying you, but I'm saying practitioners should know better. Carrots are also very high in oxalates. Yes, and if you have oxalate issues, that's another thing you just got to be careful of. So just because Max Gerson said everybody should be juicing carrots, whenever you see anything that everybody should be doing that, doesn't mean that that's wrong. I mean, everybody should be trying to eat organic, um, but you got to, it should be a red flag that you just at least question it, right? So everybody should go on a ketogenic diet if they have cancer. Uh, I don't think so. So same thing with everybody should juice carrots because they have cancer. Uh, I don't think so. So um, just question things, you know, doesn't mean that it's wrong. Doesn't mean it's wrong for you, but just question it. I was taking 10,000 IU every day, uh, all winter and still only reached 50. I'm now taking, now at 45. So they're talking about their vitamin D level. And I'm currently not taking vitamin D or K. So if you have that vitamin D, is what I said last week on the Zoom call, if you have that vitamin D that you were taking before, then go back to taking it. If you don't, get the 80K avail from us or get that bottle that one that you have was a good form of vitamin D too, uh, vitamin D also, take that. Um, and it would be good to take even 20,000 IUs. If you were taking 10,000 every day through the winter and you only reached 50, you probably need more. So don't feel bad about taking 20,000. Um, I don't feel bad about anybody taking very high doses of vitamin D if they're measuring it. So certainly won't want to be taking 20,000 IUs of vitamin D and you never measure it. Your vitamin D could be over 200. But if you're measuring it, it's still less than 100. You're not taking too much. All right. My amylase is 139. Lipase, 86. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is 5.8. LD fraction is 16. Fraction 3, 31. My white blood cell is abnormal should i be concerned we should have a talk and i don't know if you sent i'm not looking at your 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 um notes right now but i don't know if you sent in your labs or not but we should probably have a discussion so call me right and set up a time to chat I've been doing the right for about two months. Small tumors on the right breast seem larger. How long do I wait to determine whether the rife is working and whether the frequency should be changed? Well, the frequencies for, um, so typically the frequencies for the cancer. So when you're talking about breast cancer, um, you're probably not gonna change the frequencies for the cancer itself, but there may be other side things it might be good to send in a cheek swab so I can check to see if there's anything else going on that I need to add to your program. So let's let's do that. Send in another cheek swab and let me check to see if there's anything else I need to do differently. Cancer cannot grow in an alkaline body. If that statement is true, is there a list of foods to eat that supports an alkaline body and list of foods that uh, to avoid that doesn't support that? Well. Um, if anybody's been listening to me for any length of time, they know that I don't believe that statement whatsoever. And um, that is just, there's so much untruth to that statement from a physiological perspective. And I won't, and I talk about this in my book, I talk about this in different blog posts and, and in tons of different um, uh, Zoom calls. But I'll just briefly explain the physiology. Your physiology is such that you do maintain a pH intracellular and extracellular. It means inside cells and outside cells, you'll maintain a pH. And then in your blood, you, you even you maintain a very strict pH in your blood. Otherwise, you'll die. So how you maintain that pH is through your body's buffering systems. Your body has these buffering systems. Now, there may be an area in your body that's more acidic at different times and an area that's more alkaline at different times. But let's make it very clear. 
you're in general, you're going to stay maintain a pH that's fairly neutral. Just because something, you know, you've heard time and time again that, you know, cancer grows in an acidic environment, you need to alkalize, alkalize, alkalize. There is, there, there's literally no truth to that statement whatsoever. Any cell that's in rapid replication will give off a lot of waste. So when there's a lot of waste, waste is going to be acidic. It'll be carried back through your lymph system and out of your body. It'll be carried into the blood through your lymph system and it will be buffered. So the, the acidity of that waste will be buffered in your blood. Now, part of the buffering system that will take something that's acidic and make it alkaline is that this is where you pull nutrients, pull minerals from your other tissues and from your bones to help buffer it. You also have a buffering system in your liver and in your stomach. Actually, the creation of HCL by your stomach cells actually produces a side creation of sodium bicarbonate, which is used in your bloodstream as a buffering system for the blood. So the production of HCL in your cyst in your stomach actually helps buffer through alkalizing the rest of your body, you could say. Um, that's the that's the, the thing I didn't have not talked about a lot with the total misnomer of people drinking alkaline water or taking sodium bicarbonate, mixing it in their water, making it a very alkaline water and drinking that. You're really alkalizing the HCL in your stomach, thereby actually acidifying your body. So you have to understand physiology here. So I would agree that the, at the cancer site, if you have a, if you have a solid cancer, not, not the blood cancers, not multiple myeloma, not leukemia, um, but a, even not lymphoma in the blood, but if you have a lymphoma, hard solid tumor lymphoma, at that solid tumor, whether it's a breast cancer or brain cancer, it is going to be, if you could slice it open and stick a pH strip in there, it is going to be more acidic, simply because any rapid replication of cells are going to create an acidic area and an acidic slime layer around the cell. So if we could inject the tumor with sodium bicarbonate, like Dr. Simoncini did in Italy, that might be beneficial. Hence why this person is doing, um, who was it that asked that question here, is doing uh, sodium bicarbonate enemas because they have a, a, a cancer in the rectal area that the sodium bicarbonate could get at. So they're trying to alkalize the tumor. You're not killing the tumor by alkalizing it, but you're breaking down the acidic layer that you're, so your immune system can better get at it to kill it. So um, long story short, you're, you're, when you're eating good foods, um, you are helping your body stay buffered. When you're getting good minerals, you're helping your body in its buffering system. The idea that is out there in the alternative community that if you eat meat, you're acidifying your system and you're damaging your system, it's just complete physiological nonsense. I'm sorry, but there's there's doctors who write books about this stuff. It you can it just I'm this is the kind of bothers me, and I get a little hot headed about this stuff because it makes alternative doctors look foolish to anybody who's actually reads the science and understands physiology. So um, you're not your purpose is not to alkalize your body. Your purpose is to get your body healthier. Uh, you, if you could inject the tumor with sodium bicarbonate around the tumor, maybe there'd be benefits to that. We still don't know about that. You can't legally do that. And there could be other dangers of doing that. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. But um, uh, read some more of my stuff about that to really understand the physiology. So um, I think that will help you. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. And that misinformation bothers me because it makes all, all alternative doctors seem um, foolish. And I, I think that's not good. How do I get enough fat on a keto-like diet without dairy? Can I eat rice and sweet potatoes on this diet? Well, you know, technically, if you're going completely keto, no, you can't eat rice. 
Um, but I don't think they even allow sweet potatoes on a full keto diet. But if you're eating a keto-like diet, yes, you can eat rice and you can eat some sweet potatoes. So a keto-like diet is defined by the person who's doing the diet. So you're not going full keto. Um, as far as getting fat without dairy, there's some really good recipes for uh, coconut oil bombs and uh, things that are out there that are actually just delicious using coconut. If you like coconut, you have to like coconut oil, I guess, really to go keto. But um, it's um, that's some ways to do it. I certainly would suggest that e eating some rice and sweet potatoes in your, the person who's asking this question's condition would be advantageous. You recommend putting chlorine from a health food store into water to make it alkaline for consumption. Uh, I think you're talking about chlorine dioxide, um, MMS. If putting chlorine, uh, uh, I, you would not put chlorine in your water to make it more alkaline. So I, I don't, I'm not sure what you're talking about. There is a, a, a therapy using chlorine dioxide, which is MMS, but it's not to make your, it's not to alkalize. It's, it's that, that procedure is to kill pathogens. There is a chlorine dioxide treatment for cancer, but I think it's, I don't think there's validity to that. Um, I think there is validity to using chlorine dioxide for pathogens or Lyme disease and different things for short periods of time. Um, as far as chlorine using the water, you don't want chlorine in your water. It's toxic. I had more five-inch worm-like specimens after continuing with the H. pylori program and the Rifes person shared that with us a couple of weeks ago. Should I start the dewormer I bought from you? And how should I use it? So if you're talking about the fenbendazole that you, if you got it from our store, comes three little packets in there, that's a week's worth. So just do it three days in a row, one packet per day. You could mix it in your smoothie and take it that way. Just one packet a day for three days, then off for four days. Um, that's how I would think. Also, my emotions have been all over the place since this has been going on. Well, there is some emotional issues with passing parasites for some people because they're like, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's just the anxiety of the passing parasites. Um, but then there also has been um, cases where passing parasites can, you know, just you, can affect us um, from the emo from an emotional perspective because it is affecting a certain part of our brain, the you know, what's called the amygdala of the brain, where you actually hold a lot of uh, your, um, how, to, how to put it, um, memories that are, um, are have a lot of emotional content to them. And usually those are negative memories. So like, you know, memories of difficult situations. My mother died when I was seven or I was abused when I was 10 or I broke my leg and I you know, couldn't play my senior year of soccer or just things that have an emotional charge to it. Um, and there is um, data out there that um, passing parasites can bring those up. And I'm not sure the neurological connection to that, um, to sit down and kind of figure that out, but there is some, some truth to that. So Uh, there is a product called zeolite to detox the body. Do you know much about it? Yeah, zeolite is, we have zeolite in the um, clear binder product, the phase five clear binder. <laughs> I like zeolite. It's a great binder. It's a mild to moderate chelator. So it's something that people could use even if they have uh, mercury fillings in their mouth still. Um, so zeolite's a great binder. And uh, so technically a binder is something that you don't really absorb. It's really acting in the gut. And then a chelator is something you absorb and it's acting in the tissues. Zeolite does both. Um, that's why it's in a lot of good binder products um, because it, it binds stuff in the gut so that you don't reabsorb it, but plus you will absorb zeolite and it'll grab things in the bloodstream so it'll help pull stuff out of the tissues. 
I refrigerated my specimen on Saturday. Should I have it checked out or is it no good at this point? Um, if you want to save a specimen of a parasite specimen, you could put it in some vodka. Um, that would probably best protect it. I, and usually if you just refrigerate it and it's, you know, in a paper towel or something like that, it'll probably break down. Um, I would like to see some pictures of it. So I'm kind of weird that way. But if you yeah, do pass some more, I'd like to see some pictures. If you could email them to labs at Connors Clinic, I'd appreciate that. I know I'm dairy free, but would it be harmful to have a bite of cheese once every two to three weeks? Um, uh, yeah, so I really believe that, I mean, there's some people that I mean, uh, probably almost everybody on this, probably every patient I have ever had has a better diet than me most of the time. So I'm just being honest, but um, I do believe in moderation. So even if I say go dairy free to, to cheat every couple of weeks when your family's having something. I don't think that's going to cause major issues. So um, I know that most everybody would agree, disagree with me because you're all more disciplined than I am. So it will be four weeks on Thursday since my PET scans. I noticed a rash on my back a day or two ago after the scans. I've been taking three drops twice a day of your radiation homeopathic drops. The rash on my back and up into my hairline remains and has spread to my front torso. Well, I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure what the rash is from. So certainly I would say that the rash, if you do a PET scan or a CT scan, right? The, what's the negative of that? Well, with the PET scan, you're getting, you're having to drink that glucose drink with a CT scan and a PET scan, you're getting radiation. If they did give you anything else as far as um, a contrast dye, then it's simply the radiation that you're exposed to. You're not going to get a rash from the glucose drink, um, but you certainly um, could get a rash from a contrast dye. So that's, that's a chemical change. Now, the radiation... I have not heard of, I mean, definitely heard of people getting radiation therapy and will get a skin burn that looks like a rash, but it's actually a burn of the skin from the ionizing radiation. Um, but I have not heard of a rash from radiation. So I don't, I don't know that, I mean, I can certainly be wrong, but I don't know that the rash on your back a day or two after the scans was due to the was due to the scans if the scans did not if you did not get a contrast dye with the scans so the radiation homeopath is just to help pull out the radiation out of your body um certainly anything's possible um but for it to get worse that just makes me think that it's so what are some possible reasons for a rash well, I'll tell you, you know, one of the, the most, so when you think of a rash, you think of a histamine reaction um, on the skin. So what causes a histamine reaction is an allergy to something or an, a high exposure to something. Um, uh, and you're, so the reason why your body releases histamines is to stimulate um, uh, an immune response. So if um, if that thing isn't a pathogen that your immune system can kill, then you're just you and you aren't getting rid of these histamines very well, then that's what causes a rash. So a person is exposed to, you know, dander of an animal or exposed to pollen, they can get a rash or um, or a toxin, so a toxic exposure, let's say poison ivy, you're going to get a rash because of the, what's it, arsenal or something that's in poison ivy, that oil, it's an irritant, and it's going to cause skin irritation. So uh, if you have other reasons for rash, can be toxins in your body that are being released, um, stress-related rash. I remember when I was in um, school after my first um, trimester, 
going through um, my first um, set of finals. Um, after I was after it was done, I broke it out into a rash for two weeks. Over my two weeks Christmas vacation, was it an itchy, horrible rash the entire two weeks, and it was completely stress related. My adrenals were burned out. Over the years of practice, just knowing that fact, I see that time and time again where people's adrenals are just fried. And that is the reason why they break out in a rash. Um, it has to do with your adrenals' ability to interact with the HNMT gene, which helps you break down histamine in the tissue. So um, I later figured that out. So it's the stress in itself. That's why stress can cause those things. So when you burn out of your cortisol levels and your adrenals are in a, in, a, in a strong adrenal fatigue, you can end up with all sorts of problems and rash is just one of them. Baking soda and salt baths helped me after PET scans. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. So that can be helpful. Um, when I start doing smoothies with greens and fruits and four different real mushrooms, I start feeling really bad and tired. Okay, so if you're like putting real, you know, mushrooms from the grocery store or the health food store in your smoothie, mushrooms have a lot of mycotoxins in it. So you won't have mycotoxins in um, um, a mushroom capsule, like you're taking a mushroom pill, like turkey tail, or you're taking our medicinal mushrooms. But if mushrooms themselves can have um, different spores and certainly mycotoxins. And uh, many mushrooms um, should be cooked before eating them. So, um, so I don't, I wouldn't put raw mushrooms in my smoothie. So I would not do that. Could I be detoxing too fast and too hard? I don't think it's detoxing. I think it could be a sensitivity to the mushrooms. I don't, we, I don't, I mean, sometimes I'll have raw mushrooms in a salad because I ordered it at a restaurant, but I never put raw mushrooms on my salad. I, I don't think we should be eating raw mushrooms, honestly. I think all our mushrooms should be cooked. Um, and um, better yet, you know, uh, water processed <laughs> in a uh, hot water bath, which is how you get how our mushrooms that we use for medicinal mushrooms are used. Um, I think raw mushrooms can have issues. I, I would not be eating raw mushrooms. I'm high in metals, arsenic, blah, blah, blah. How to detox these metals? Metals is my second reason to make him a cancer patient. Okay, so we do have to have a, a chat because um, Having you don't you, okay. Remember, you have access to these courses. This course right here, I wrote specifically because of a question just like this, not from you, but I've got this question over thirty-five years of practice. I have high heavy metals, and I need to do chelation therapy. I'm gonna start right away. Uh, 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 uh go and start watching these videos in this course. There's seven modules in this course. And I know it's like, I don't want to have to do that. Well, then call and I'll talk you through these. But you need to understand the seven phases of detoxification. If you just jump into chelation, you have a very strong possibility of making yourself very sick. So I'll say no more. Sorry, sent the rash question too soon. I also have other itching, rectal and vaginal, as well as much as you know, all over. Even where there is no rash, I take a daily detox bath, baking soda, Epsom salts, charcoal, essential oils, daily, plus coffee, enemas, and soda. Could this be a histamine reaction? And what should I do about it? I would, um, I know you're going through a lot of stress. Maybe stress is the is the main issue. Is your adrenals are just fried. Um, I know, let's see, let's go back to this supplement list. So what would you do if somebody's if somebody's adrenals are fried? Okay, it's a medical term. Um, you use adaptogens. It's the first thing you go to is adaptogens. You know, somebody once said, if you were on a deserted island and you could only take one supplement with you, what would it be? Well, adaptogens would be right up there. Um, 
big you know, berberine would be probably my favorite in medicinal mushrooms, but adaptogens would be right up there in the top five. And the reason why is because adaptogens help balance your hormones. If they're too high, they bring them down. So if you're, so there's different levels of adrenal stress. So if you're under an, a, you know, an acute stress and you've had healthy adrenals, your cortisol could be very high. That could be very dangerous. If you had a long-term stress, your cortisol and your adrenals could be just, just toasted and your cortisol and your epinephrine and your epinephrine are just really low. Well, wherever you don't need to, you don't need to do a adrenal profile to know what you're at because if you just take adaptogens it'll bring your high cortisol down and it'll bring low cortisol up so let's just look real quick here if you have are taking you have adaptogens um in your list here uh well maca is an adaptogen but it's really mainly an adaptogen just for estrogen doesn't really do much for your adrenals Uh so glutathione is is good if it is from radiation. Um, and I think we addressed this taking hydrogen peroxide orally last week. You really aren't on any adaptogens, so getting a, a good adaptogen would be in order. Um. Our, uh, we have multiple adaptogens and we have multiple adaptogens private labeled, um, either our adapta clear or our corda clear would be a good choice. And adaptogens, the way you dose it, I have people that take adaptogens and they're taking like nine pills a day until they get through their stress, you know, thing and then you necessarily don't need to take them. So adaptogens aren't something that you necessarily take every day. So adaptogens you use like you would use a medicine you're under a ton of a ton of stress and, and issues that you take a lot of adaptogens. And then when things calm down and you're not under that ton of stress, then you, you put them in your cupboard and you only use them when you need. What do you think of bindweed for angiogenesis? I don't have a lot of experience with that, so I don't know. I haven't seen a whole lot of data on bindweed. Um so I, I can't comment. I mean, you don't want angiogenesis. So if bindweed helps decrease angiogenesis, then that's what you want. Is Ezekiel toast okay on a keto-like diet? Well, anything's okay on a keto-like diet within reason. So um, I, I, if you're doing a keto-like diet, make sure that you have a glucometer and you're measuring your morning glucose. Um, that's the way to, to measure. If you really want to do full ketogenic then you actually get a ketone meter and um so that's different but i would just do a glucometer um far less expensive far easier to monitor uh, remember ezekiel bread is not gluten-free if you're on a gluten-free diet just so you know is the 8.8 .8 alkaline water with electrolytes at the store okay to drink my friend said it's not considered clean water. Okay, so that goes back to our should we drink alkaline water question. My answer to that is no, you shouldn't. I don't think you should be drinking alkaline water. I, I think it's a waste of money. Just drink good, clean water. Um, you don't want to alkalize your stomach acid. I got a phone call just as you were answering my question about when to change rife frequencies and I didn't hear your reply. So let's do a cheek swab. So let's do a cheek swab just to ch check and see if there's anything else we need to add. So just send in a cheek swab in the cheek swab form, please. How do I get a fully updated list of supplement recommendations? Well, we need to do another cheek swab. I sent in my current list last week because when we tested you, you were taking those things. So we need to do another cheek swab. And this is the list that I copied and pasted. So um, I need to know, you know what's your current, the, this is with the cheek swab that you send in. If you run out of any of these things, take them off the list and, and send in a new updated list. Um, could you list everything I should be taking? Yes, and I'll be more specific for you. How long do I do 
the on and off dewormer protocol. Yes, I bought the five boxes from you. I would just, if you have five boxes, I just do five weeks and stop. So five boxes should last you five weeks because you're going to do three days on, four days off. So that'd be one box per week. I had a contrast dye through an injection for both the pets. Yeah, then it could be the contrast dye that you're reacting to. So um, then, you know, as far as what you're taking right now, that will help with the contrast dye. Certainly glutathione will help you because that's the uh, antioxidant will help with um, breaking down what you had there. Looking if you have any binders or chelators in here. Um, zeolite, that will help. So I maybe up those two things. That would help. Um, quercetin would certainly help. It's not going to help pull out the dye, but it'll help decrease the inflammation. You could increase that. And the liposomal glutapir increase that until this, this settles down. Keto Mojo makes a good ketone plus glucose monitor for about 50 bucks. Nice. Can stress increase morning glucose? My hot flashes are worse at night, so I wake up a lot at night either burning up or freezing, not exactly relaxing. Well, you really want to understand the physiology of that? The answer is, if you have healthy adrenals I mean, and you have stress um, and you're waking up at night, um, yes, you'll have a higher glucose. And the reason the physiology is that cortisol released by your adrenal glands break down glycogen stores, which is the way your body makes stores glucose. So glycogen is a long chain of a bunch of attached glucose molecules stored in your liver for night or at night or for needing use. You heard about people going to run a marathon and they do, um, you know, carb loading. So they'll eat a pasta dinner. Well, it's been things that have debunked that because you could only store so much glycogen, but you will store glycogen in your liver. And how you release that is through cortisol release so if you're under stress you're going to release more cortisol it's going to increase your glucose levels because it's breaking down the glycogen stores in your liver increasing circulating glucose because under stress you burn more glucose so you need it so think about that but also when you wake up in the middle of the night um what kicks in your adrenals do so your adrenals kick in you release cortisol and you will get a higher. So if you sleep really good, you sleep all night long, um, uh, you're going to have, you know, all things the same. You're going to have a lower morning glucose than if you woke up four times to even go to the bathroom. You just, you weren't stressed. You fell right back asleep. You got up to go to the bathroom. Your blood glucose is going to be higher in the morning because you released cortisol just to get up to go to the bathroom. That's the physiology of that. For those who are. So I uh, apologize if um, we went long again and I talked too much. But I do, you know, I think just the more educated everybody is, I think the better. I just think you, then you can think through these things and make your own decisions. That's why you need to listen to these things, even if, you know, you can't stomach listening to me. Put it in like fast forward mode or something. So I sound like a chipmunk, um, but you can still absorb some of the information. Question, the person about the detox question, make sure you do watch those videos on detoxification. Um, my favorite of all these courses is the autoimmune, just because it's the last one I did. And I think there's a lot of really good information in there. All right, know that I'm praying for you guys and I hope you're praying for us and I love all of you and keep up the good fight. Know that um, the enemy wants you dead and you have to just keep fighting against it. All right, bye-bye.